Hey, I got something, something to say I'm just so sick of hearing everyone complain I know it's tough and I know there's pain But hitting bottom is the only way to change So I'll keep hustling, you keep struggling Awesome! We are hustling. Welcome to Crypto MC and welcome to a special interview with Vinny Lingham. Uh, good morning, Vinny. Thanks for joining us, buddy. Morning. Great being here. Thank you for having me. Great stuff. So um, we have, uh, as we were saying backstage, we are a, a TA traded channel. And um, this is, a, a, I think, a, a very nice uh, surprise to get Vinny on to discuss FOMC for us. Um, you know, as we know, we are battling a big fight with Bitcoin at the moment. Lee and me, we're trying to get an entry, trying to get everybody in. So um, we kind of want to see what the Fed minutes means and the fact that we're going into a big weekend where there will going to be a banking holiday on Monday. And, uh, and, and I think that plays a big role. So the first question I think, Vinny, that we would maybe want to just ask everybody or or answer for everybody what would you say is the main goal of the fed we know what would be the the goal that they quote to everybody i mean i mean they've got hidden agendas there what would that be it's a good question um it's hard to say because the fed is a bunch i mean it's not just one person it's it's a bunch of special interests right um i i'd say that their stated goal is to you know maintain a healthy thriving functioning economy um with low inflation uh, and supporting, you know, sort of sustainable growth. You know, how they do that is another question, but that's what they're supposed to supposedly trying to do. Um, I think that, that unfortunately, we, we, you know, I mean, I don't want to be an ageist, but unfortunately you have people who have lived through a very dark era of no information, no digital communications and, and, and collectivism. And they, they're really at a point now where they're dinosaurs and you know, hence my profile picture. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 they're dinosaurs running the world economy and they don't realize how much has changed and how irrelevant, um, you know, some of the things that they try to do are. And I just don't think they've got the, the mental capacity to absorb what's going on in the world right now. And I actually got a question. I actually got a question. A, a, a very nice statement you did there. And there's Vinny's dinosaur guys. Um, cool looking badass dinosaur there. So, um, I'm, I'm running, for, running for the FOMC. Um, if anyone wants to vote me in, I think I'd fit in perfectly alongside. The well, board. I'll give you my vote, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you my Um, so I had a question today, and a buddy said, um, so when will it be in the interest for them to jump onto the crypto bandwagon? And I said, well, it kind of will never be, in my opinion, because yeah. for that to happen, they would want to or should be able to then control it again. So in theory, the only way that they will, and correct me if I'm wrong and maybe weigh in on this, is when the, it's no longer going to be in their interest, but in, uh, in, a, in a situation, put them in a situation where it's going to be a necessity. Yeah, the, the Fed will be the last to fall. Um, you know, once China, Russia, every other country in the world, you know, sort of adopts crypto, Bitcoin, whatever, uh, then, and the Fed realizes they've lost, that's the only time they can adopt it, which is probably a long time from now. I mean, after China. Mm. Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> China will not adopt crypto. I don't think China will China adopt, crypto. adopt crypto either. Because so here's what yeah, this, this is what this is. That's what I'm saying. It's like it's so far away. I can't even predict what will yeah. happen. The, the issue really is that China wants the digital one to become the global currency. Mm-hmm. Okay, the U.S. dollar. They need to maintain the, the petrodollar standard, and they want the U.S. dollar to thrive. And, and these are two opposing forces, and, and they've got battleships, and Bitcoin doesn't have any. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, so like when you've got when you know, it's, it's the same as all the Bitcoin. You're like, look, I I, I feel for Bitcoiners. I, I know where the mindset's like because I've been there before. But everyone who goes on like, hey, you know, you you have your keys. They can't take my Bitcoin from me. I'm like, no, if they rock up at your house with the SEAL Team Six, they can take whatever they want from you. You'll give it to them. Like, you know, <laughs> like the threat of deadly physical force to anyone is, is, is it's a real thing, right? Especially when you're dealing with the government. So. I don't know how we we get past the world where like maybe if governments totally collapse worldwide and it becomes an anarchy, but then like that's a scary world anyway. Um, I, I, I don't see I don't see the Fed embracing uh, Bitcoin anytime soon. <laughs> well, okay. So I think our biggest hope is to kind of say that they learn to live with it. Yeah, that's I, I mean 
essentially what you want to have is you know crypto being a a you know a parallel economy to the world economy and thriving and functioning in its own right and it gets to a certain sort of size but nothing too big that it threatens everything else around it because and maybe maybe over you know like maybe the disruption happens slower maybe we just start disrupting industry by industry company by company and at a reasonably slower pace um but you know maybe we get rid of visa mastercard get rid of uh, credit cards move on to better payment rails um and 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 that's fine the moment it starts disrupting global economies that's when the governments are going to tamp down i mean look at what happened in canada they're trying to go after all the truckers uh, crypto wallets and suspend their wallets and accounts and stuff and what well, you know at the exchanges and it's a problem i mean and remember we, we you know whether we want to admit it or not we we, we live under the the, the graces of governments. I mean, the governments of the world could shut down Coinbase, they can shut down Kraken, they can revoke licenses. If governments of the world got together and said, okay, we're done with crypto, you, you kill off all the on-ramps and off-ramps for fiat, all of a sudden the crypto prices go to zero. What do you do when you can't you know, move your Bitcoin through an exchange? You, shut, you can't really trade it. To one, but like the person-to-person trading stuff doesn't scale very well. There's lots of security That's issues. True. It's cost of transactions. So like... You know, well, let's, just be, let's just be intellectually honest here. Without governments regulating and allowing crypto, it wouldn't survive. If they banned it, they could ban it. Like, they, they could. Will they? They probably won't. But if it became too much of a threat, if we go into a... If we went, look, if we went into some sort of world war scenario, which is not unlikely right now, as we can tell, um, you know, a lot of people in certain countries will have to move their money out of those countries. And those countries start, you know, blockading currency flows. And then you start buying Bitcoin, using Bitcoin to move money across. Uh, out of these countries, all of a sudden, Bitcoin comes under attack because it's allowing people who are, you know, refugees or whatever, fleeing a country to take the country's wealth and leave. And so then, you know, then, then the attack sort of doubles down. So then they call the neighbors. They say, we have to ban Bitcoin. I mean, I think it was, uh, um, it was the UK or it was, I mean, there's so many countries right now trying to ban Bitcoin and ban crypto. Um, I, like, we haven't really seen the fight yet. So, look, I am actually bullish right now. <laughs> so... <laughs> Let me That's just good. tell you, like, uh, because I think governments are very slow to act. And I think that, uh, you know, any action will be as a result of some much bigger um, event where, where, where crypto or Bitcoin or whatever really causes a lot of pain for them. And until we get to that actual event, that like tipping point, mm. uh, that watershed moment, I think we're fine. I think we can keep doing yeah. what we're doing and keep building it out. I think it needs like a, a major event for us to just see a turnaround. And so I think at, the, yeah. Sorry, at, at the moment, I think there's so many big guys, big institution, JP Morgan. I mean, everyone is buying Bitcoin and there's so much money for, for them to be made at, at right now at the moment because it's unregulated. Um, they can do whatever they want at the back, you know, and um, there's too, too much of profit to be made for them to, to shut it down right now. Yeah. So I, I'm bullish. I think that... Yeah. Uh, there's billions of dollars in crypto funds raised last year. They're still deploying the money. Um, a lot of the crypto companies. I mean, people people think that institutions, like old school institutions, are going to hold money. No, no, no. It's it's the new economy institutions that are going to hold crypto. Like it's yeah. the companies that are funded by the, these VCs backing them. Who says, look, you know, we've got a hundred million dollars. Let's go put twenty five in Bitcoin, twenty five in Ethereum, twenty five elsewhere. Keep twenty five in cash, or whatever the number is, and keep going. So I I don't think that. Um, I don't think that we're, going to, we're waiting for this sort of institutional money to come. I think that we're waiting, you know, we're waiting for the for the crypto economy to grow, and people have more profits and and and, and investment there, and they they invest in, in crypto. So when I look at the charts and look at the numbers and the prices, I think Bitcoin is is very much like hit a double bottom at at 30k. I don't think 30k breaks. I think we're we're you know we're locked in there. Uh, it's kind of like the 3k levels of the previous run, um, which is about 50% above the previous high. And I think that we, I hope we actually just go sideways for another, you know, couple of months. Um, and I think the sideways action is actually pretty good. Um, my recommendation to people who have portfolios is like, and I've, I always tell people this, whether it's a bull run or a bear run, it's like, you got to maintain 20% in cash in your portfolio. Oh, right. Don't be greedy. I, I, you know, I think 20 to 25% cash is, is a minimum. Now, obviously, the wealthier you are, the lower that percentage you can get because you don't really care about the portfolio at that point. So your guys are worth hundreds of millions or billions, they don't care. They, you know, they have a fixed number. But everyone should everyone who's not in that level should have 20, 25, maybe 30% cash. And the reason is 
if this is a, a winter, a crypto winter, and it's a bear market and everything drops 90%, your cash will help you buy back things 90% down for what your average price is. And you can cost average down. And so everyone, you know, I've made trading mistakes. I've bought stuff too high. And but my, my, the way I correct the mistakes is I then go and buy it when it's down 90% and cost average it down significantly. So, you know, I, this is the one thing like I have to tell people in, in, in crypto is you have to keep dry powder for, for dollar cost averaging down in down markets. Do not be greedy on the upswings because you just effectively over leveraging your, your portfolio. And the, 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 you know, some of the biggest successes I would say come out of like buying, you know, if people bought Ethereum at 1300 and left um, uh, three, whatever, 30%, 25% of their cap cash, of the investment in cash, when it dropped down to 50 and it's hard to time the bottom and they said, okay, well, it's down, you know, 90 something percent, let's buy more. They would have been sitting pretty well right now you know, at 3000. So this is the thing Like you actually have to, you have to understand that you, you're keeping cash is part of, it's part of tra investing. You cannot go hundred percent cash long. I mean, hundred percent, uh, investment. Yeah. 100% agree, Definitely. especially in crypto. No, crypto is worse. I would say yeah. even in traditional stocks, you can keep 10% yeah. cash. It's fine. In crypto, mm. it's more like 25 to 30. Yeah. That's the reality. And if you don't, if that doesn't get maintained, you're also not taking profits on the ones that's doing well. You know, and people forget about that. You know, where does that dollar come from? Do you just leave it there and forget about it? Because if you deploy it, you first need to have taken profit somewhere. And, and it's a balancing act, meaning yeah. that I've got something that's doing really well. And the goal is, as an investor, I don't want to try and see where the top is. Let's yeah. take some of the foam off. And then there, I've got more money than I need. So let's look for a bargain or wait for it. No, no, I you say wait for it. You wait for it. You, the, way you, the, way I, the way I treat it is I look at my portfolio and go, okay, this is down 70%, 80%. It's looking really bad, below my cost average. I need to deploy some cash into this to protect that position. So you got to use your cash. If something's down fifty percent, I don't, I don't cost average it. I'm like, what's the point? Like, if you have a hundred, uh, hundred crypto X's at, uh, you know, ten bucks and it goes to five, then you buy another hundred. It's not, it's not going to change. It's not makes a difference. Like, it's okay now you're at seven fifty, maybe who cares, right? If the thing drops down to fifty cents, you're still going to lose a lot of money. You have That's to right. wait for it to drop down to like a buck, or you know, I'd say down eighty percent. Then you start looking at buying. 70% is, 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 is still, I don't like, 70% down for me is not cheap enough yet, <laughs> okay? <'Cause laughs> it's, just, it's a 2x up and you're kind of back in the other zone, right? So 70%, 80% to 90% down, you've got to pile into the stuff because it just, it, 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 the, the math around it makes it, because otherwise your initial investment is so bad, you have to fight, I mean, at 20 at 80% down, you have to 5x on the current spot to get back your principal break even. Your profit. Yep. So if you can't protect your portfolio by, by cost averaging it down to a reasonable number, and obviously if it's down 90%, you can get a really, you can get a steal. 90% is a steal, 80% uh, is a deal. And then eight, eight, yeah. eight, eight, seven. Yeah. The, the so, hidden yeah. hit number. Yeah. Eight, eight, seven. Okay. Eight, eight, seven. So if you... 88.7%. 88.7% is a sweet spot buy. Uh, <laughs> we'll buy that any day of the week. <laughs> why not 88.8? <laughs> uh, it's it's a fib level. It's a, the Fibonacci tool that we oh. use on Trading View. Oh, 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 From the true. bottom to the top, eight eight seven. That's the eight eight seven. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it kind of it kind of talks to that ninety percent that you're saying. Seventy percent just doesn't doesn't quite cut it. You know. Yeah. No, 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 that's the right number. Eight eight seven is the right number. At eight eight seven, yeah. you should double your position. So at, at, at eight eight seven, I would double my position of what I have if if I have a position that's down. 88 percent so if i have 100 of it i'd buy at least 100 more i'd, I'd like double down that position because it just it, it changes the cost average profile no that definitely does and it makes for um it makes for an interesting journey if you think about every bitcoin retracement was around 88 7 85 80 percent and i mean so there's enough information in the crypto space to support this but this is the tricky part the smaller the wallet i found the less patience the wallet holder has as well. well so somebody with a thousand dollars, the less capital they have uh, in, in dry powder. This is the other problem with crypto. Yeah. Like I know a lot of these like retail market traders, they tend to be family members who try to copy me. <laughs> and what what happens is they go, oh, Vinny bought this. I'm gonna go buy this too. Vinny, like, and like guys, 
just because you buy like buying what I buy is not to make you money. You, you, the, the, that doesn't guarantee it. It's like the willingness to hold it long term, the willingness to double down when it's down eighty eight point seven percent. It's like that is part of the successful trading strategy. Yeah. It's not just you know stock selection or coin selection by itself in a high vol market doesn't it will not make you successful. It's the conviction and the ability to keep liquid that makes it. That it, it and because this stuff takes. I mean, I've been in the industry for nine years now, nearly ten years. So that's a that's a complete different uh, dynamic, and you've learned that patience. Uh, and I think that's the one skill set that you don't read in a book, and it's the one thing you can't just say. You know, we can agree; it's easy to agree with you today, but uh, I think we all can be honest. I mean, I I started making money realistically when I stopped trying to say what I'm going to do and actually do it, and that's the that's the hard part. And uh, yes, that uh, that fly by night buy entries where people want to make money tomorrow because of a good call or a good project. That's kind of the guys that we we want because when they're interested in it, we kind of know that it's time to start selling more. Build up that dollar portfolio. Well, and, and, Vinny, oh, yeah, the flip side, by the way, is if something goes up 10, 10x, sell 10%. Like, you shouldn't be greedy. Like, always sell. If something's up 10, 10x, always sell 10%. Get your capital back. You're good. You know? There's, there's, no, there's no reason to keep... Uh, and because if it goes up another 10x, then that's great because, you know, that point doesn't really matter. Yeah. But if it goes down, at least you have your dry powder that you can use if you want to. But, I mean, typically I don't buy into things that are very – so when I've got something that's up 10x, I'm not going to go – even if it goes down 50%, I'm, I'm still up 5x. I'm not going to buy more. Because like I said, I take my positions early and I hold them through. And the other thing about taking smaller – so, like, sometimes people get greedy. But the thing about not being greedy is, you know, like I've taken positions and things where I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be greedy of this. And then I just never want to sell it because I feel like I never bought enough, which is fine. So then you basically just skim off the top. You take, you know, you take your, your capital out and you just leave it. And that actually gives you much better returns because you don't feel this, this like uncomfortable. I have too much money in this position and situation. So, so I always like tell people like put in whatever you think you want to own or something, put it half. Okay. And then put, put the rest in cash and just leave it. And then if it drops 70, 80%, then you can buy more. And if it goes up, just never sell. And maybe take your capital out when you're done, and then that's a good way to hold positions long term. That's a nice way to also help um, that little greed monster because we we want to we want to have everything in the winning one, and there's just no way. I think we we say that there's three legs to being a good a profitable to be profitable in trading and investing as such. The one is technical analysis. Now, if it's done wrong, you you become a gambler. That's the guy that draws the line and says, okay, it's good. This is what needs to happen, and then they they put their everything in the hope in that little that that dynamic that it's going to bounce on that line and then when it doesn't oh world comes to pieces and and that falls in and then fundamental analysis you're the guys that um you know the fundamental guys create the 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 hodlers you know it's a good project i'm just going to hold but they don't make money either because if you're up 90 up and you're all the way back to 90 percent because you're just holding you don't have any cash to to grow and then obviously timing, the guys that want it tomorrow, you know, money buys, uh, money buys time. That's the reality. That's why we want money. We, it gives us more time. And that's the main thing. So if your timing is right and you understand that that's now the time to get cash in on time, it means that you've got money and now you have to wait and, and wait for the next right opportunity to grab it. So I had somebody that phoned me up a while back, way, 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 way back, buddy. I got money today. Can we go sit tomorrow morning, 9 a.m.? And you quickly tell me where must I invest everything. And, and, and I think that was the, the click moment for me. And I think you can uh, say that as well. You know, there isn't a time. It's not like a job where you can say, right, let's quickly go sit and see where to deploy. It's that, that thing you point to, to patients who say, well, we have to actually wait for an opportunity to come. Just because you've got money doesn't mean it's the time to do it. Yeah, I think... The dollar cost averaging works on even on, on a longer term. Like, look, if, if you were going to invest and you put all your money in on a certain spot date, you're taking a lot of market risk on that day. You don't know what happens the next day, etc. If you break it up and say, look, I've got, you know, let's say I've got 300,000 Rand or whatever to invest over the next, uh, you know, couple of weeks or months, just put in 10 grand a day. Go put on a daily debit order, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the daily investment stuff that most these sites have, recurring buys. So, you know, buy 5,000 rand of Bitcoin a day or whatever you want to buy, Ethereum or Filecoin or whatever, every single day. And then just cost average in over a few months. Because 
like you know, if, if you are a long term holder, which means that you don't want to sell anytime soon, you should try and get a price in. Don't get caught up in the hype and don't get caught up in the depression either uh, on, on both cycles. You just say, you know, if it goes down further, I'm, I'm trying to own, I'm trying to invest this much over a period of time, put it in, and then feel comfortable about it and keep your dry powder in case. Like it's very unlikely that you, you're getting a, a cost average in and then your cost average drops 90% because you're not picking it. Because like by using a, a time-based cost average, except when the market's maybe going sideways before a big dip, um, you're basically reducing a lot of vol, day-to-day -day vol. The, the, the intraday vol on crypto is higher than anything ever. It's like it's higher than most people's emotions. Okay? So the intraday vol is, is, is crazy. So don't try and time vol. Um, they, I mean, look, I, I give this advice to people who are... Um, I'd say, you know, early beginner, early investors uh, haven't had a lot of experience. If you're an experienced trader, ignore what I'm saying because you can make up your own strategies that work for you and do your own thing. But for beginners, like this is kind of the the the, the dummy's guide to like not losing your your, your shirt on crypto. <laughs> that's true. I mean, if you look at it, if you go to any coin that had a big spike, look at the amount of time that it was flat and look at the amount of time it spiked actually. So if you do that, the, uh, the time that you're going to be buying it at the worst possible time is so small in relation to the big picture. Exactly. You just can't, you can't, you can't mess it up in that sense. But that's a strategy, Vinny, that also then pays 10 years down the line. It doesn't pay next year or probably even the year thereafter because it depends on where you where you might have started. Sometimes you get it lucky and you and you start entering the crypto space at the bottom. I wish I did. I entered it right after the top. And um like most people do because that's when it's marketed. That's when everybody knows about it and and new people take interest. And uh, yeah, well I I stay away from coins that I see are being shilled a lot. So if I see stuff where people are like, "Oh, you should buy it whatever, Cardano, you should buy this. I, I don't touch those coins. Like, I really don't. Because, you know, what happens is you have this, like, this show mechanism and people want to, like, pump the price up so they can sell. Whenever I see someone pumping the price of a coin, that's, you're not seeing a buyer, you're seeing a seller. That's Every time looking for a seller. Yeah. Marketing a money, marketing. You know, people exactly. are paying for this, <laughs> these shows. And, 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 I, and I'll be, like, I haven't sold any coins since May last year. <laughs> so I like whatever coins I mean, like talking about on, on Twitter or from, I've, I've sold nothing. Like I don't sell shit. Like I sell when markets are going crazy. I don't sell when it's like in a flat market. And so I, I'm different because I don't, I don't really go show stuff because I, I, like the stuff I buy, I don't want to sell. So I don't really need, I don't need exit liquidity um, on it. But for other people, when I see like a lot of people flocking to a certain coin and like pumping a certain coin, these are sellers. These are guys trying to get the price up so they, they can dump it on you. Don't buy that shit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Trading and investing is all about cheating each other out of your money. That's the whole word, trade. I want to think about it. I, I said big brother, little sister. Big brother has got a, 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 a two rand or two dollar coin and little sister's got a 50 cent coin, which is bigger than the, the rand or the dollar coin. And Big Brother wants to get her out of that. And the way he does it is by showing, you see this one, looks bigger, is heavier. I'll rather give you my little one and you give me that. I'll give you the big one. You give me your little one, which is the stronger buying one, which is the, yeah, and, 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 and that's it. And who is not tricked their little sibling out of money that way? And that's what happens every day. We're trying to trick each other out of money. Uh, yeah. Lee, your short's doing well, buddy. Did you see? <laughs> That's my second one. Yes, doing well. Second enough. short for the day. But, now um, in the game. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. to keep it simple, crypto is all about you know finding the next guys that is mm, stup uh, more stupid than you to buy to buy the coin from you at, at the more expensive price that you bought it at. Yeah. <laughs> so so let's let's get back to the FOMC, Vinny. I mean, um, I want to ask you a big question. So we got really good uh, un uh, unemployment figures, or basically an additional half a million jobs were created. And that then kind of shines the green light for them to say, okay, it's good. Uh, and increasing interest rate is okay because if there's more jobs, it means that the economy is actually strong. But will what will this then do going forward? Because now the, the minutes came out and they said 25 basis, 250 basis point, quarter of a percent. So how is this going to really impact uh, job creation going forward? And um, 
And I mean, inflation in, in the whole mix, I mean, that's a big question. So maybe you can weigh in on that and your thoughts on what this will do to inflation if this then starts stopping or slowing down the creation of jobs. So the biggest, the biggest risk that the Fed has right now is that the rate hikes push the country into a recession on the, on, on, on the eve of a potential couple of conflicts globally. And, you know, the, the Fed said that, that inflation was transitory because of the supply chain issues, but then they want to raise rates at the same time. Or, they, you know, I guess they believe it was, and I think it's not. But, the, like, functionally, I think it is largely um, supply chain related. So, like, my, my view on this is, I think the, the Fed has signaled, I, I mean, people th- people saying uh, eight rate hikes this year. Look, I think if we, if we get to, like, one or two rate hikes this year, we'll be okay. I think if we go, like, three plus, we're going to have a, a serious problem, and I think we, we risk a recession. And so, I, I think that the market is pricing in way more than what's actually going to happen. The Fed is notorious for finger wagging, which is, like, coming out and saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, the market overreacts, and then they don't have to do what they, they don't have to do what they were just threatening to do because people react to it. Um, I think that uh, the the political climate in the midterm elections of this year is going to really cast a, uh, you know, a shadow on whatever the Fed's plans are because I don't think the Democrats are going to win. Um, I think the Republicans are going, to, are going to walk this one, and now you're going to have this, you know, this split sort of leadership again, and I... Like who knows what happens, and then you got you know election you know next year election year sort of uh, candidate prep, uh, trying to figure out who the candidate is going to run for president the following year. Like it's this is we're getting to a, like a very difficult political time in the U.S. I think that the pressure to raise rates to keep inflation down is less than the pressure not to raise rates and keep uh, and keep the money flowing because the the political classes need the economy not to go into a recession or otherwise the Democrats are going to lose the White House. And that's basically where we are. Yeah. And and I think if I'm, if I'm right, it's never in history been a case that you've got a Republican um, sitting in at president for four years, followed by a Democrat sitting in for four years, followed by a Republican sitting in for four years as well, which is going to be something new. And it's maybe something that's going to take away the vote oh, of right. confidence of who's, who's I'll, running the, the dollar I'll, now. I'll add to that. I'll add to that. What if Trump comes back and gets actually elected for the next run? You think that? It's very possible. I mean, people discounting him, I, I, I don't think you can. I think he's going to make a run for it. And I think is a, you know, if, if it's Trump versus Biden, I don't know if Biden wins again this time. Uh, that's a scary thought if you think about it. If, if it's Trump versus Biden, I, I'll take the Trump bet any day of the week, no, realistically. Like Biden's pushing 80, 80 something. I mean, he hasn't been seen in public for weeks. Everyone thinks he's asleep at the wheel. Um, like nobody wants, I, 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 like even the people who voted for Biden that I know, are like where, where is this guy? What is he doing? And uh, everyone's concerned about his mental sort of fortitude. So, you know, he's our president, but like we're not. Yeah, if, if Trump goes up against him on the on, on the campaign trail, I don't think Biden runs again, and then the Democrats have to fill a gap. So then, who do you have running against Trump? This is, this, like tr- Trump had the most voters ever ever turned up, like to the Republican Party in history. Like it's actually kind of scary if you look at the numbers. Um, you know, and I'm not a Trump supporter, so I'm like I don't like the guy. But you know, <laughs> I love you. I don't like the guy either. My wife likes yeah. him, and uh, it it's created some conflict in our own home. It just it shows for the popularity that this guy has. I mean, no, we're living in a different country, and we're debating your president. Well, no, fair enough. I mean, like at some point, I'm going to throw in the towel and come back and like run for president of South Africa. But like, whatever. Because <laughs> like, if I, if I can't fix it in America, maybe I'll fix it back home. <laughs> Good luck. I think this is this is where we need Liam, Liam Neeson and that Taken movie where he says "Good luck." <laughs> but okay, that's going off point again, um, Vinny. So so basically, what you're saying is that a lot of finger wagging. Uh, a lot of overreaction, but now there's, there's, I mean, I mean, keeping tabs on what's cooking around, and a lot of guys are saying, okay, now, so if you're getting ready to invade, 
a different country. Uh, and um, Russia basically said they, uh, they, they're not going to outlaw crypto. And then Ukraine came in and said, okay, well, they're going to be looking at crypto as well. And then you've got Biden now launching the thing. So everybody's speculating on it, but I haven't really found a concrete theory around why this is, or maybe it's just coincidence. And if it is, you know, give me your opinion that it's that all this news are coming, you know, smack after each other on the eve of a banking holiday weekend, and um, and with minutes that basically meant that the whole world overreacted. Well, let, let's go through the mental thought process here. So let's assume Russia invades Ukraine. Now, what does the U.S. do in response? Well, you're not really going to throw troops back at Russia, but you are going to, you know, clamp up on travel um, sanctions, pressure on other nations to add more sanctions to Russia. All of a sudden, they're going to go for, well, let's, let's impose financial isolation to Russia. And so you can't do transactions with Russian companies, country, uh, uh, you know, citizens, individuals. So what happens then? Well, Russia says, okay, well, we need to circumvent and show that America doesn't control the financial rails of the world. We're going to run on Bitcoin or whatever crypto they want to run on. And now crypto no. is not regulated. So now basically they can invade any potential, um, you know, any potential uh, 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 compliance and, and, and regulations around moving money around. And they just start paying for stuff in Bitcoin. And like, it's, very, it's very interesting to see how countries... Um, who are against the U.S. financial system, which basically controls most of the world. Because if you don't, you know, if, if your corresponding banks are money laundering or whatever, they get cut off from the global financial system. It's controlled by America. And so Bitcoin poses a threat if a, if a large or powerful sovereign nation decides to, you know, use Bitcoin as rails or use any cryptocurrency as rails. I mean, you know, so this, is, this is the problem. The problem is that, like the response, the response to the war is is may not be a physical one; it'll be an economic one, and then there's economic workarounds because the world's evolved. I was I was actually a while back. I was, I was listening to I think it was Robert Breedlove that said um, the it only takes one economic power to decide that you know to have Bitcoin is going to be a bet against whether it succeeds or not. And I would rather have some now and have that bet in my favor to kind of tip the scales into other countries following in on the argument because they would, in theory, be late. They have to buy more in order to offset the advantage that one economy might have on it. So meaning if you're saying the argument that Russia then uses Bitcoin and for all intents and purposes saying to their own advantage, it would probably then mean that the Fed's going to have to try and overcompensate for that by getting even more. And and that opens the door for everybody else on the sidelines saying, wait a minute, what if some attention turns towards me and I need to defend myself? Um, and I then also need to get to the party. And that brings that hyper adoption theory to light. So what is your thoughts on that thing? Well, I mean, I don't think it's kind of strange that the Biden administration is pushing cryptocurrency regulations right on the eve of potential conflict. They're like they're trying to get it pushed through quickly because they know that their response cannot be physical at this point. Russia is a nuclear nation, um, so it's going to have to be economic. And so they, they're trying to close the the, the fiat the fiat sort of crypto rails uh, for Russia and make sure like this is why they want to they want to basically push this bill through and it's being rushed because they need some something to use uh, you know the, the, that's like that's 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 the way I would I would sort of portray it right now and that's just one look guys we're all armchair economists this is be frank we haven't we don't have access to all the information we don't know what's going on okay. troop movements whatever we're, we're sitting back and I'm just giving you my observations but it looks kind of sus suspicious right now that this bill's being pushed through um I would be I would be shocked I would be shocked if the US puts like major troops on the ground and starts you know, engaging in even a cold conflict with Russia. I, I think it has to be economic sanctions. That's true. That's true. So, uh, so it makes for uh, regardless on how and which angle you want to work, if you want to say if it's all just a big bluff or it's a bluff to bring another bluff in. Um, I mean, the fact that Bitcoin isn't at this stage in anybody's control, I think it's like a, using it as a bluff can can theoretically be our double-edged sword, meaning regardless now, the fact that it's being used 
is going to be bullish for us. That's, I think, the big takeaway, because, you know, what, what, what's to, what's to, who's to benefit out of them taking or making use of it? It's us. Yeah, I, I think Bitcoin is going to have an interesting run now because I, I do think we get over 100,000 this year, most likely, or at least close close to 100 or above. Um, I, I don't think it's going to come from um, you know institutional investment as much. I think it's going to become a lot of retail. I mean, there's there's something like 20 to 50 million um, millionaires in the world, dollar millionaires in the world. And like it's 21 million Bitcoin. So if they just want to each own one, I mean, the price is going to have to go up. Not enough. Like, That's it. And, and if, if the world goes into sort of a global conflict situation and you want to have some money to you know leave your country or whatever, just have like one Bitcoin lying around or two Bitcoins lying around. It's probably just sufficient, just you know, in case like think of it as insurance money. So I, I think that's what happens this year. The the on-chain metrics are showing that there's not a lot of Bitcoin floating around right now. Um and so we just need a some sort of catalyst, and I think we'll, we'll see a bit of a price explosion. And, and then, then, then it obviously flows into crypto. But what I, I do think is there is a risk of us going through this like next hype cycle. Everything goes to the roof, things start looking crazy, and then we have a major crash. At that point, we're crashing two or three trillion dollars worth of global wealth, and then you're going to have the governments re- responding. So, so I think that, that my my I wouldn't say prediction, but my um, my intuition is that we're still due for not, one more big run up. But after the next crash, that's when the government's going to start trying to tamp down. Not just the tier then, then it's big enough to take notice. Sorry? It matches my TA. <laughs> yeah, it kind of puts the TA, but I mean, fundamentals and, and these type of things are important for us to consider and to keep in mind. Otherwise, you yeah. trade in a bubble. So, Vinny, you really shone a light and uh, given us and, and the viewers a, a few different angles to consider, especially over the weekend. So I don't want to keep you. I mean, your Friday is only getting going. Uh, I want to say really thank you for taking the time and come talking with us. Uh, in the future, maybe we can do this again. And uh, and uh, hopefully then what we will have is even more um, outlandish things happening in the FOMC so that our armchair economists that we are can actually speculate and have fun about. Uh, and the end of the day, I think um, this was awesome. Uh, thanks so much, Vinny. And um, yeah, maybe you can give us a closing sign-off remark and uh, we could go into the weekend. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, closing sign-off would be, uh, I you know, wish everyone well this weekend. I think I do think that one thing observation I make is like everyone expects the weekends to be low liquidity. Um, and I think that's going to change because I think people who are, you know, the smart money you want to buy are going to start buying on weekends. And I think we'll find, we'll, we'll start seeing uh, the, the weekends bouncing back harder over, over time for that reason. Um, because nobody wants to buy during the weeks now because everyone's selling on weekends. Okay. Well, let's go buy on weekends and people are selling. It's a, the more we stay in the flat market, the more the we'll, we'll start evening out the buys and sells across the seven day cycle. My thoughts. So, so now you've opened a brand new can of worms for us because that's kind of the direction that we're portraying and, and the angle that we were thinking. So now you've got me worrying about my own theory again. But thanks for <laughs> thanks yeah. for leaving us with a question. I mean, how, how does it get better than that? Um, it means that we always have to stay on the tip of our toes. Thanks, Vinny. You have a lovely day. Thanks, uh, cheers, everybody. Thanks, guys. Well, now I need, to, I need to try it over the weekend again or what? I wanted to take my weekend off. <laughs> have, you, have you taken profit on your short? I want to yes, ask you that. It's done. Profit bank. Drop profit banked. Sweet. So that was a nice run. Where did you get it? What? I, I Where did you get your short? 40, 40, 400, 40, 450 until, you know, the first leg down. I took profit and then this price pumped up. I took my short again, which was at 40. 4700 and some and then yeah. i just closed it at 397 396. Ah, so they offered nice me two nice nice short i missed the long i wanted to take a long i missed it by 50 dollars and the short it in so yeah good okay now, well, now we're done gonna... i mean we made two successful trade within like 50, 30 minutes that is yeah. what you want to do you know pick your time it's not like you open the chart you want to you want to trade you want to take a long you want to take a short and let's take a short no you wait for your entry you wait for the time and yeah Trade less, that, but trade, uh, trade better, trade well. Well, Lee, so on the note, I think let's not hustle too hard this weekend. In any case, um, there, there is 
the forecast of probable vol- volatility coming from Vinny, and I will definitely take that to heart. And um, and on the fact that you've made some nice gains and some success, let's wait and see. And just remember, guys, uh, big picture wise, big time investment entries and portfolio entries, they don't happen within a minute time frame or 15 minute. That buy zone normally is the one that hangs around the most. So we'll have the time to grab them at any end of the day. So you should also go and enjoy your weekend, guys. And if you're in the stage, your long weekend. Lee, buddy, as always, I think we need to keep hustling. and um, yeah. But not, but and not my, that hard this weekend. My, no, my buy uh, limit is still there. The one I wanted, uh, like I showed um, this morning, is still there with oh, a yeah. stop loss. With a stop loss and the take profit. So but that's, that's going to be a long-term, I mean, a mid-term swing. So... I'm just going to take it and yeah, all the risk management are in place. Um, if they go below 30, what was it? What did they say? 39, no, 37 something. So my stop loss is pretty yeah. low. Yeah. Now my bottom buy is sitting at 38, 7, 30 on my analysis. Stop limit yeah. above the, below 37, uh, 800. So um, exactly. let's see what the market does. I mean, it's definitely one thing I think we can agree on. It's not a bullish turning market. It's a long-term bullish market. But if you want to be trading at this stage, this thing needs to sort itself out, find a bottom, slow down, and then we can grab those buys. Lee, thanks, buddy. This was an awesome week. And everybody have a lovely weekend. See you on Monday. Cheers, everybody. Have a nice weekend.